Welcome to Singapore. Oh my gosh. Let me do that thing again. Full screen. Yeah, yeah. Um, just go back one. There we go. Uh -oh. Anyway, you probably have all seen the note well before, but uh, I'll put it up here for just a second since it is Monday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, blue sheets are going around. No, they're not. Blue sheets will be going around momentarily. Um, I believe we have uh, Elliot taking notes and, and somebody doing a uh, jabber. Uh, the, uh, I guess the next thing would be uh, working group documents. So who do we have up first? Yeah, maybe you, you already do you want to just get up and say a few things about AKA or are you ready for that? Or that might be the quickest. So I don't actually have any slides. I can talk about the uh, uh, 5448 this and then the PFS document, both of which are working group documents. The the BIS is about to be sent to the ISG, I believe, and uh, there's been a small update of that, and that is uh, through Joe's uh, review. I identified that there's a few references that have received a new RFC um, or those references have been obsoleted or the RFCs have been obsoleted. And uh, so I just replaced them with new ones. So this was for the NAI RFC, for IQV2 RFC, I think the IANA considerations RFC. So that's a simple thing. Um, I don't have any other open issues at this time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that we've this is document is uh, well ready to go forward. So I'll hit the button after this meeting. Yeah. And then on the AKA side, uh, there were two updates recently. One for the deadline, and then you uh, know more proper update uh, today, a few hours ago. Um, and uh, there's no huge change, but uh, um, it, it does um, include a few things, which I, I'm listing here from my, my notes. Uh, the first thing is that we changed the document to uh, do an update. It has an update header at the top. It says update uh, 5448, or rather the, the draft that will at some point get an RFC number because we are extending it noting that uh, and then I changed the wording around what we say about this document and its optionality it's optional uh, but now it also says that its use is recommended basically based on you know better security properties and then uh, there were some somewhat unclear references to the uh, the curve uh, uh, 25519 and uh, how the different numbers are generated. So there was a reference to, I uh, can't remember the RFC numbers offhand, but um, but there's the, the, the RFC that actually defines the curve and then there's the RFC that uses it for IKV2 and actually deleted the IKV2 uh, reference entirely from that uh, and just refer to the actual curve definition RFC um, and uh, simplified some uh, uh, AKA and SIM card terminology and made some other editorial changes. So I, I believe those are hopefully largely uncontroversial things. Um, we did identify when John and I were discussing, we did identify one remaining issue 
that we didn't quite know how to deal with. So, so this draft defines one algorithm, the curve 25519, um, to do things. And what it does is that it carries this in, in one attribute uh, that defines, like, we're going to do this um, particular extension, and then there's an attribute for uh, for, for this um, uh, algorithm, this entire style of uh, uh, key generation. And now the question is, is it sufficient to have one algorithm? Or should we already from day one have two? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I, I'd like to hear opinions. And uh, secondly, how do we handle the registration of these numbers? So. So now it's kind of like everything's bundled together. If you do this thing, then then there's one number that that refers to like this particular style of key generation, and and this particular algorithm. You could also separate them, but then there'd be more attributes. Um, and uh, John had also suggested that you know maybe it would be possible to refer to some some other re registry of um, algorithms of this this nature. Um, that's a possibility as well. Although I was looking at some of the the existing registries and their number spaces were kind of funny that they were not sort of uh, neatly positive small integer numbers. But um, I think it was a cozy um, registry that was a little bit uh, funny in that sense that it included also negative numbers and so on. But um, I guess the main question is, do we need something extra in terms of additional algorithms from day one? And if so, is the current structure of attributes sufficient or not? Hi, Ari, it's Elliot. Um, uh, let me take a stab at, at both of those. Um, the first is by um, referring the question about multiple algorithms over to you know to more more knowledgeable people um, who are understanding of what the state of standardization of the various curves are, because particularly at the NIST level. Um, because if you have another standardized curve that I know, I know they're coming along, but I don't know where where they where they land. It seems to me having a second, uh, having a, a another go-to one, is is a useful um, way to handle failover in in case of a crisis. Um, that's just you know one view of it at least. Um, the second point about having multiple registries is. Um, does having an entry in the registry, what, what does it imply in terms of implementation? If it implies nothing in terms of implementation, then overloading sounds fine. If it implies something about, if it implies something about an implementation in terms of, yeah, you, you have to be able to man, you have to be able to support it. Is it an MTI? Is it an option? Then, then overloading's bad. Yeah, that's a good point. But I, I think there's a separation between like the requirement level that, even if we just write things in, in our document, we'll have to say, and even if we have two or three algorithms, we will have to say that this one's mandatory and these other ones are optional or all of them are mandatory. So that decision has to happen. There's a separate thing about do we actually reuse somebody else's number or not? Yeah, <clears throat> John Matson. Um, so I think it would be good not to, to specify make the document more general and to support a set of algorithms. I think curve 25519 is correct to have as the mandatory to implement. Uh, 3DPP, when discussing Suki encryption, 3DPP decided to standardize both curve 25519 and P256. There is also has been in the past a general wish for 3D people to have. Now they did not choose that for Suki, but in the, there has been a wish to have stronger algorithms to be able to uh, um, f for government requirements, government wanting to use cellular systems. So I think curve uh, the curve P384 would also be good. To, and maybe in the future it will be curve 448. But uh, I think that would be very good. No, just to support them for uh, as Moose says, I think curve 25519 has mandatory to implement everything else optional. But it would be good if the document could just. <laughs> The best thing would be if we could take the COSI register or the TLS register and just refer to that and say, look, here is how to 
to uh, use any of these that already standardized also for this. I don't, there's complications. How do we transfer them? Is there any TLS, IPsec, COSIS specific in, and how do we transfer the identifiers? But these are still for um, analysis. But I think that would be in the best, that would be, be the best option if it can be solved practically. So I like the idea that we could have one mandatory to implement uh, the current one and then add one or two more. Um, and it sounds like uh, you have good candidates in mind, so so that's great. Um, we can we can put that in. I can talk to you offline. Um, the the, the re reuse of the registry is still troubling me a little bit because it seems to me that there's when we add algorithms, there's always some specification needed that like use it this way and. Um, it's not just the numbers that, that is in the registry, so you actually have to uh, maybe um, you, uh, specify also something. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's a question of whether we can just, it doesn't magically add to get added to my implementation just because there's an entry in somebody's registry value. Uh, Dr. Kivinen, yeah, I think it's much easier to create your own registries and use them because then, then you also, you know, are control of your registry. So you are not end up in, if you're using somebody else's registry, they say, no, no, we don't want to have that. We don't, we don't, we don't care about that uh, algorithm. And they don't allow you to put something in there. <clears throat> and then you say, oh, but, but we want to, we want to. And, and because you are or, or they add the null algorithm. Oh, they are add stuff there that is not usable for you because they say, oh yeah, we use this hash based, you know, to, to um, it's only hundred, uh, you know, megabytes of, uh, you know, this public key. Uh, it's no problem in our uh, protocol. It might be a problem with your. Yeah, I guess John's point was like, I mean, I agree with you that, that it's probably uh, lower cost for us to do our own thing. Um, but uh, John's argument, I think, was more like uh, <laughs> lifetime cost of this. It's initially easier, but is it cheaper <laughs> in the long run if somebody else does, does some amount of work? So that, that's the trade-off. Okay, so this is Elliot again. Short term, long term, okay? Short term, clearly, I, I, I think I'm coming down on, on your side. Long term, this is something that should be referred back to the IAB because it, the, there are so many different forms of encryption used in so many different places and so many different registries. If you go through all the IANA registries, the stuff repeats itself again and again and again and again and again and again. And um, so it would be nice if we had a, a, a clearer way in the IETF uh, to do that. But in order to do that, it means that we can't have a lot of customization going on within the individual uses. And that refers us back to John's work Right in the TLS 1.3 document, how much how, how much customization has to go on in TLS 1.3 to adapt for EAP TLS, TEEP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the long term issue. Yeah, and your your reference to IAB there. Uh, this IAB member doesn't know what the answer is, at least. But maybe there's some other IAB members that do. Yeah, the round number. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so it it sounds like there's there's a, some more work to do here in terms of just uh, getting you know a couple more algorithms in there and just figuring out what the mechanism will be. Um, so. <laughs> yep. Thank you. All right. Next uh, TLS one three. Uh, so this is a presentation of using TLS with uh, using EAP TLS with TLS 103. It's in version seven. Next slide. No, that was too fast. Uh, there. Um, so there's been two updates since the last ITF based on. Ah, there. Thanks. <laughs> uh, based on the post working group last call comments. Uh, changes from five to six is um, based on 
support in current TLS implementation, especially OpenSSL. So OpenSSL does not support sending the empty string as application data, even if it's allowed by the RFC. So to fix this, the ETLS draft was changed to sending a one byte of zeros. Then it was added clarifications that the server must the client must send a single byte, but the server must accept everything. Uh, quite standard. Uh, then there is, uh, yeah, another change also based on OpenTLS is that OpenTLS does not allow the server to send uh, early data in the server hello, which is allowed according to the RFC, but not implemented in OpenSSL. So we updated draft to also allow sending the commit message in a separate uh, uh, message. Uh, that's, and then between 06 and 07, there was a, a review by Jim, mostly editorial and clarifications. The commitment message is now called commitment message everywhere. Uh, there are some privacy considerations on padding and listing that TLS 103 has padding and recommend its use. Uh, then there is additional references to the TLS 103 RVC on security considerations and clarifications. And there's a reference to the now working group adopted draft IETF EMU so about certificate used and an informal reference to it does not depend on that. Next slide. Uh, the only remaining issue and, uh, that has been debated on the mailing list post working group last call is uh, whether to allow ETLS 103 with PSK and if yes to that answer, how to allow that. Um, so this was starting by a comment by Thomas Haura that EPSK e does not provide any identity protection and does not provide perfect forward secrecy. And he suggested to <clears throat> allow PSK in EAP TLS. Then there was some discussion that EAP password uh, provides perfect forward secrecy, but e password is not really uh, suitable for IoT. Uh, devices. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that's, we, and IoT use cases are where people has been on the list has been wanting to use PSK authentication. Uh, last, uh, lately on the IETF list, I think most of the comments have been positive to doing this. There's been <clears throat> wish to use this in IoT, use it in TEEP, and so on. Um, uh, so, but if we should do that, then the question is, should it be, should this PSK use the same method number? Uh, and should it be defined in the same document? On the first question, I would say, uh, yes, I don't think it helped having a, the same a different number. The second, I think a new document would be the preferred. I don't think we should wait for this. And I think we need time to discuss any issues here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the important thing to understand with this is that EAP TLS is used in very high security installations where additional modes are not just a bad idea. They are forbidden. Okay. So if you add this stuff into the RFC, we'll get it banned. It will not only not get implemented, it'll be forbidden to be implemented. So don't start messing with this and adding it like a zillion additional authentication modes. Do it separately because you're, you're talking about extremely high security installations, which will not allow PSKs and other stuff and adding a zillion modes, which will have never been implemented and never tested is, is an attack on, on, on national security. It's not, this isn't like a useful thing to do. It's very negative. And we can, we're going to end up forbidding this RFC from ever being implemented if you do that. Okay. So 
Bernard, uh, this is Elliot. Um, the reason that this whole conversation came up was that we're, we're working out actual operational flows that we need for IoT, right, and for, for onboarding. And so that <clears throat> we see the value in using ETLS PSK. It's defined, right? So the question is, why can't we use a mode that already exists? Well, it, you can create another code point for it. That's fine. But if, if somebody's... The point is, it was forbidden in the original drafts. It was forbidden for a reason. It was because it th there was there were security proofs that were required to get it deployed. Those proofs are invalidated by what you're adding here. Okay, so so people wanted to do very specific things, and only those things, and and only those things were allowed for those particular installations. They were very high security, certificate based things. If you want to do something else? Just get another code point. Do it there. Don't add all of these, all of this additional stuff, which will inv it'll invalidate all the security proofs that are there. Um, you know, cause a ton of problems, and because of that, it will have to be banned. So this stuff, I mean, you're just going places that you just don't go there. Just get another code point and, you know, d do it separately. Just so people who are people who negotiate this particular code point know exactly what they're getting. What that also implies is that any sort of new definition within a client hello that the TLS people define means it can't be re-imported here without without f further being standardized. Being further standardized. Well, a code point in where in which in which. Um, okay. Do whatever you want. Just don't don't stick it in something else for for different terms. Yeah. Um, so the the document currently says that external PSK is forbidden. So my suggestion would be we keep that and discuss PSK in an additional draft. Then people are free to implement that if they want to. Well, the other alternative is to simply add the code point, right, and discuss it in this draft so don't, we don't have to constantly revisit uh, e I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we don't have to constantly revisit ETLS again okay, and again. Yeah. again. Mohit, um, uh, no hat. So as an author, I think it's it's non-trivial to just say yeah, PSKs are allowed and we are done with it. As, if, as we have seen from the discussion on the list, there is all these questions about what identities to use, whether PSKs uh, using EPLS with PSK should we allow resumption tickets and resumption PSKs. So it's not a done deal. Uh, personally, I'm I'm fan of small modular documents. I would favor. So I I, I agree with Bernard that probably having a different method number makes sense, anyways. Or, or type code and then having a separate document and figure out the issues as we kind of implement this because currently PLS PSK at least is not implemented uh, in, in the open source WPS supplicant. So as we learn along the implementation, we'll probably need to make, make changes. And there's no point holding on to the EPTLS spec until that. Uh, Owen for you, Cisco. Just want to confirm: authentication PSKs are fine with an ETLS. It's just the ex the external auth PSKs need to be split out. Uh, so, sorry, uh, resumption PSKs are fine. External are fine in TLS 1.3. Those are fine. That's absolutely fine. Okay, it's just the external PSKs need to be split out. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Seems to be. So, so suggesting is to use a different code point, no objection to that. It seems still a little bit discussion whether it should be in this document or not. Yeah, so let's just, just want to check the room. Uh, is anybody opposed to using a separate po uh, code point for EPTLS PSK? Okay. So I, I think um, that's, pro that's a good direction to go forward with. Um, the next question would be whether do you use the same document or a different document? Um, 
We can uh, take we take a hum. Sure. Yeah, we can. Let's take a hum here. This is something I'm pretty sure we'll have to take to the list. First question I'll ask is if we uh, will use the if we should cover EPSK in the same document. And the next question will be if we should do you do EPTLS PSK in a different document. So hum if you think we should do it in the same document. Hum, if you think we should do it in a different document. Pretty, pretty <laughs> close. So I, I think we'll, we'll have to have some discussion on the list, but Elliot. Yeah, so there's a reason why I think we should do it now, deal with it now, yeah. because Alan and I and a couple of others uh, have gone through all the effort to sort through these issues already um, on list. And we, we've, done all, we, we, we've done a lot of the work. We're, we're coming close to closure on it. And so to spin up another document to have to do it has two causes two problems. The first of all, it's a lot of work to spin up a document for this. The second issue is that I think about it from my reader standpoint, which is, okay, great. Now I have to essentially, I have to um, uh, uh, reconcile uh, two documents to figure out how I'm gonna do my implementation. And I, I think that's actually more complex uh, for me than, than having a, a single document. Uh, oh, and I'll give one reason why I think it could possibly be a separate document, uh, and that is um, we will need some guidance from the TLS working group and possibly in a route of the TLS 1.3 to give some implementation guidance on differentiating between resumption and authenticating PSKs. And getting that guidance from TLS might hold up this document. Yeah, Owen for you. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I mean, we can, I think that we, that should be brought up in the TLS working group. I don't know if we've, if you, if you guys done that, I'm not sure if you'll get the guidance you want, <laughs> but um, if we, we should be bringing that up, if you, you know, you can post an errata or just bring it up on the list. My, uh, so I agree with Owen. Also, I don't want to publish any spec which doesn't have implementation. So if you are going to wait until the TLS PSK implementation has moved forward in WPS applicant, this we would basically hold on to the TLS document as well, which is more or less ready to be shipped. So that's another reason why I want to do it separately so that we can have some time to implement and learn from that. It's one thing to say, yeah, we have figured out all the issues uh, in the draft, but I'm pretty sure when we actually sit down to implement, there will be some, some questions that, that remain to be answered. Okay. Were there any uh, comments on Jabber? Or... It's okay. All right. Um, I, so I think uh, we'll continue discussion on the list of both resolving the issues with uh, PSK mode, like the identity issues, I think are primarily the issues, and then also um, work through this separation of the documents or doing it in one document. Yeah, second bullet, quite by should uh, <clears throat> server allow authentication with both certificates and external PSKs? This is um, just a draft in TLS right now. Don't know how far it has progressed, but probably a later question. I not clear that that is even forbidden in the current EPTLS. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then relationship between EAP identity and NI uh, when using external PSKs. There, there has been quite a lot of discussion, even suggestion in the on the list. The suggestion that seems to be agreed upon that when using external PSK, you should also uh, provide a realm that can be used as an anonymous NI. Uh, and then discussion, I think no clear answer should we distinguish external PSK from resumption PSKs. John, yeah. on, the, on the point relating to providing an anonymous NAI uh, with, with PSK. Uh, so uh, Alan and I uh, went around on this a couple of times. The issue we have to be careful about is you can't always use that anonymous NAI. You have to um, 
it, or, or it's or it'll simply break feder federation. Hmm. Um, you have to be somewhat circumspect as to how you use the anonymous NAI. So for enrollment purposes, maybe you need to do something along those lines. If you're talking about TEEP, for instance, hmm. um, <clears throat> but you can't. If if you're already enrolled and you want and, and you want to essentially use the NAI to route on, then which is not an unreasonable thing to do. We do it. it that's the, a, a, a pretty massive use of, of EAP at this point. Mm -hmm. We can't just use an anonymous NAI. And this actually impacts EAP noob, it impacts TEEP, and, and a few others too. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think the, the current text in the EAP TLS 103 document says that anonymous NAI is, you must support recommended to use, must use privacy friendly. Identify. I think that would apply also for so, this. Mo 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 Mohit, uh, uh, you can still do federation and routing with anonymous NAI as long as the realm is correct. So if you have ever used Edurom, there is a field where you you put the anonymous NAI. As long as you put the correct domain part in the realm or in the NAI, your uh, authentication request will get routed to the correct server. So I, I don't. I think that was an incorrect statement to say that you can't have anonymous NICE because you need federation and routing. Sorry, sorry. What I meant to say, Mohit's right. When, what, what we're, there's a separate discussion, and I mixed them up. There's a separate discussion going on about when to use a standard uh, realm identifier. And that's where things can break uh, federation. That's, uh, and so you're right. You, you're absolutely right. You can use anonymous NAI. Yeah. Uh, uh, fourth bullet is to distinguish between external PSK and resumption PSK, and if there should be any guidance. I think the, it might be hard to control both of these external PSKs. You might have control of, but it might also come from some other source. You might want to reduce existing identities in the organization and derive identities from from that. Um, the internal uh, Resumption PSKs are typically decided by the TLS application. So the EAP implementation might, might or might not have an influence on that, depending on how much they want to reuse or um, mess with the TLS code. Uh, but I think these are both of these things are things that should be discussed, but I don't think we can end up in any must look like this. It's more like guidance. Yeah. No. Dan, Har Dan Harkins, are you done with the slide? I've done. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the CFRG is working on a PAKE selection process. So if we do separate things and have TLS 1.3 as one document and PSK is a different document. Uh, why would you want to wait for the PSK one and just do do a peg? Because it's probably heavy and not very IoT friendly for I, small devices. I, are you going to do a, a Diffie Hellman in in the PSK? Yes. Then it's not any. I mean, it's like a Diffie Hellman in half <laughs> to do a to okay do yeah. a, a balanced peg. Yeah. Right. You, you you could do something that's considerably more than a Diffie Hellman mm -hmm. in half, but I mean. I I, th I think it would behoove this group to wait a little bit to do the right thing because uh, even with doing a Diffie Hellman, it's still susceptible to uh, an offline dictionary attack after an active attack. Uh, so I think using a peg would probably be uh, a, a really good idea. Yeah, I think if you use if you use password with the PSK version, it's weak. I think passwords and PSKs are some sometimes people misuse it, but otherwise it's different use cases. You have PSK in IoT where you have some third part, you have some distribution system of these PSKs, and that's secure. Then when you have human involved setting things up, then you have passwords. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to comment the same thing. Yeah, PSK is PSK, which means it's a, it's a preset key, it's not password. Yeah. Which, which means it, it's a strong, long entropy key. And in the IoT environment, it actually might be that. In well, lots of the other environments, it isn't. Hmm. So that's why I think that there is still a use for, especially in IoT environment, for EAP, EAP PSK in, in that case, because it might be, even, even if it's a little bit, only a little bit faster, it still might be enough there. I think we should all disabuse ourselves of the notion that, you know, 
uh, the, the guidance we, we recommend in, in the security considerations of an RSC is how it ends up getting used and saying, well, PSK is a PSK and not a password, and therefore people will use PSK with PSK, you know, big, long, giant strings and not, not with passwords because we know that they're not going to do that. People use the tools that they have, and they sometimes use them wrong. So if we come up with tools that are misuse resistant, then it doesn't matter if they use it right or wrong because it's still going to be strong, and that, that's the point. Yes. We can't prove the idiots. I mean, if they use make me a tasty code as their uh, uh, password, it doesn't matter if, our, if you're using PAKE or PSK, if the, if the password is same for everybody and known by the, you know, <laughs> everybody. So, so I mean, if nobody follows our, any, anything with right, we are, you know, losing anyway. If they use weak passwords, one letter passwords, it really doesn't matter whether you are using fake or, or PSK. All right. Okay. So, so, this is the last let's, comment. Let's, on okay. This yeah. Topic. Let's, let's not make arguments from an absurd position. You know, the, the, the absurdity <laughs> of somebody using a one, a one letter password, you know, is, is not, not a, a serious argument. So. Okay. So we have a little, little, little more discussion to be had on the PSK topic. I think if we decide to have a PSK in a separate draft, then I think the the EPTLS 103 draft is ready to proceed. Uh, I, I think there's still a question on identity. Still, we need to make sure that that's clear and there's no ambiguity in in the even with certificates. So I just we want to make sure we verify that. What question is that? So how you know what? what goes in the identity field. Um, I mean, so there seems like there's still confusion and Elliot was bringing up, there may need to be a specific identity format. So in general, the document does not really specify, I think the NAI, so I think it needs work. I, I don't have the specific right here, so, but okay. let's, it, it may be fine, but we need to make sure that it's fine. Okay, can we, I am, I only see the, ident in, for PSK and for certificate extensions. I don't know if there's something specific for EPTLS. In that case, we should make sure to very concretely take that discussion on the list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, next, uh, yeah. So this is about certificate handling and I have zero slides on this. You can take next. <laughs> uh, there has been no comments since the last time and no updates. Uh, if I interpret it positively, it's <laughs> the draft is, is is done and ready to proceed. Um, so I would see as the working group last call. Um, if uh, and at least that forces people to. Review. Just has anybody uh, reviewed the latest draft? I mean, I don't know if it's changed at all, but hmm. no. Okay. Yeah, so I, we can start a working group last call. Fine. So yeah, we'll we'll begin a working group last call sometime after this meeting. Alan, can you put yourself in the queue? You're up. There. Um, am I coming through okay? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, this is just a summary of um, my thoughts on identity. So as you were saying earlier, the the current EPTLS document is a little thin on the use of NAIs um, and when and where. So if you go through, go to the next slide. Um, 
there was some discussion. I had sent a long email to the list, um, which I couldn't find in there in the list archives. The, the short summary is that we should, I think we should really recommend using the anonymous NEIs everywhere. Um, clearly people should be allowed to do other things if they want, but then it won't be compatible with roaming, which is a, a very, very common use case. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, there's some additional discussions. Um, so this is sort of the summary of which identities are where. Um, you have the username, which is used in AAA routing, the EEP response slash identity, and then the PSK identity or certificate common name, um, which is commonly used in TLS. Um, they're often the same, but they don't have to be. Um, I think we can agree that the EEP identity and the username have to be identical. Um, there are requirements in the various RFCs to copy the EEP identity into the username field. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, common practice is that the EEP identity is derived from the common name for certificates. A lot of UIs also allow people to um, enter an explicit outer uh, username for PTLS or, or, or TTLS. Um, with TLS 1.2, this EEP identity is exactly the common name because the, the certificates there are usually public. For TLS 1.3, EEP identity should be anonymized. So we can say that generally, instead of having the user configure two different things, um, we could just say the common, the EEP identity is derived from the common name by using the realm portion. Um, so it's routable and maintains user privacy. So next slide. So for PSK identities, um, whether or not we allow uh, EAP TLS to use PSK for pre-provisioned PSK identities, um, we can recommend using the NAI form and we know that works. Um, or if there's a need for identities which do not match the NAI requirements, we can just say people use whatever they want for the PSK identity and then separately use the NAI for the EAP identity, right? So the idea here is it doesn't really matter what the PSK identity is. We know that the anonymous NAI always works for routing. Um, so if we go to the next slide. And resumption, um, the EAP application doesn't necessarily control the derivation of the PSK identity for a resumption. So it's safest to assume that it's just this opaque blob, which is not UTF-8 and not an NAI, and therefore cannot be used for the EAP identity. So again, we're left with an anonymous NAI, um, which then allows the resumption to be routable um, and decouples routing from the PSK identity. So we can use different identities for every resumption, which gives us some level of privacy, even though the MAC address is usually there and can, um, always the same. And then it doesn't affect routability of the packet. Some of my earlier comments um, were that the resumption session should use the same EAP identity as the original authentication. Um, so if you're using an actual username for the original TLS authentication, it's probably a good idea to use an actual username for the resumption simply for consistency. Um, if you use the anonymous NAI everywhere, then you should just use it everywhere. So next slide. Um, so yeah, we assume that generally authentication will be routed. Um, if it's not being routed, then identities don't really matter and people can do whatever they want. Um, but in general, um, it's good practice and people pretty much always do this nowadays, even if the requests aren't routable, they just use the anonymous NAIs everywhere. 
Um, and I guess the, the, my, my, my recommendation having looked into this is, is I think the EAP TLS draft should be clearer as to which NAIs it's, sorry, which identity it's recommending, um, and why. And I think it should recommend the anonymous NAI everywhere. Um, and I think going forward a, let, a little bit, the, um, TLS 1.3 for other EAP types documents should probably also do the same thing. So I think that's it for these slides. If we go to the next one, I think, nope, I think that's it. Um, questions, comments? Hey, Alan, it's Elliot. Um, uh, I really mostly uh, agree with pretty much everything you said. I had a question about uh, handling uh, uh, normal TLS certs, if you go back to like uh, the, that, that slide, not PSK, but just the, the, the other, other form of a, yeah. a um, is your presumption that there is something that approximates a realm within the cert? Um, generally, it's the common name, and people use that. But, you know, based on um, other discussions on the list, uh, we probably should have a separate NAI realm OID in the certificate too. And then that can be used for the anonymous outer identity. That's, okay. a, that's a whole separate discussion as, as to where that NAI, which, which field of the cert that NAI comes from is a separate discussion with I, for now, I'm just waving my hands and going, it's in there somewhere. If the cert says it's for example.com, we probably want to use example.com in the EAP identity as an, as an anonymous realm. So the, the reason I mention it is that there are some implications here relating to I, IEEE 802.1AR, which has no such form as I, as I understand it. And so um, I like your answer earlier, which is just use anonymous NAIs, but what if, if that has other implications, we should explore them. I, I, I don't think it has other anonymous implications. This is really, the, the text on this slide is really more just background as to what people mostly use now in the common um, derivation, uh, the common practice. And after going through this and sort of running down the checklist of all of the different possibilities, um, everything comes out with use the anonymous NAI. So I think that should be the recommendation independent of why. It's worth having an explanation, but it's worth also just having the recommendation of, you know, just use the anonymous NAI everywhere always, no matter what. Yeah. Jo yeah. Matson, you say that there should be a recommendation, but the ETLS 103 draft already have a recommendation. It says that anonymous NICE are mandatory to support and recommended to use. So I don't, I don't, really see concretely what you are missing for the certificate use case, for the BSK use case, you have a lot of other. Um, sp speaking as an implementer, um, I, I, I guess the text on identities is buried inside of the resumption section. So it's not clear that for normal authentication, you should use the anonymous NAI. Um, I had some text I, I sent to the list. I think I also opened a GitHub request. I think it would help to have a separate section in the document saying identities, um, which you can then discuss, hey, some certificates have these identities, some don't for resumption. In any case, for this list of reasons, here's why for ETLS, the EAP identity should be the anonymous NAI realm. Because I, I guess for me, it's, it's, it's not clear if that text is buried in the resumption section. It's not clear to me as an implementer reading this, that this field, which is separate from resumption, should have a particular value for particular reasons. Sure. So uh, Bernard about Microsoft, just, uh, just a comment, which is that, um, you know, at, it, in some systems, I have seen uh, the radius server make different suggestions of different methods for different people, right? So, what that means is that there can be more than one more than one anonymous NAI used by or an organization. 
say they decide yeah. high security users are going to all be forced to use EAPTLS and lower security users use something else, TEEP, whatever. Um, uh, and it's worth thinking that the, the EAP identity, right, is not method specific. It's for any method. Um, so we're really talking about here kind of upgrading privacy for really everything, not really specific to EAPTLS. And I guess my point is that <clears throat> when you're asked for an identity, you don't necessarily know what method you're going to use. So saying this is this is the identity you should use for EPTLS, those are not necessarily correlated with each other. Um, it's, okay, yeah, I mean, to, to a certain extent, yes, but I think we still need to have some recommendation for the um, implementers of EPTLS as to when they're trying to negotiate EPTLS. They need to have a of an initial starting point for the identity. And that's where the recommendation of this anonymous NAI comes from. Okay, I think that's it then. Okay. Thanks, I think we'll have some more discussion on that. Yep. Alan, I guess it's it's still you, so can you join the queue? There we are. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot to add on this document. I think there's just one slide if we go to the next one. Um, I think the document's okay. Did get a response from Microsoft supporting this approach for PEEP. Um, it's not clear what to do with FAST. The text in the document is sort of my initial stab in the dark, um, but it would be good to actually have um, some review of that for FAST and maybe something from implementers um, saying that this works and is interoperable, but I don't think anyone's really done much of anything with uh, with FAST and TLS 1.3. Um, I think based on discussion on the list, the TEEP updates probably belong here. Um, and then I think the document should be published close in time to the EPTLS document. I know the, the response from Microsoft was that they wouldn't touch anything, including EPTLS, until they could rev all the other TLS types too or TLS-based EAP types. Um, I know that uh, EAP TLS is for TLS 1.3 is implemented in WPA Supplicant. Um, I don't think there's been any progress on PEEP or, or TTLS there, and the same thing in my implementation, um, mostly because we're not really sure what to do. So if we can get some additional feedback here, then I think we can get the various open source people to update everything and implement everything. And then we know it works. Um, I think we just need consensus from the working group that yes, this is okay and we should, we should be moving forward with this. Questions? So are, are you, are you in touch with folks who can help with uh, T uh information because i think that's been a kind of an open issue is that we have some errata still open and uh there's been some discussion but not quite enough and i know folks are talking about implementations want to make sure that uh we have the right folks uh involved so that we can get the document updated in a reasonable amount of time so this is a word out to implementers yeah, it's, it's basically what's, what's been on the mailing list. Um, I know Microsoft was saying that recently they have, uh, I believe they have TEEP in recent uh, previews. Um, but yeah, it, there's, there's been no sort of coordinated effort from implementers to get in a room and go, this is what we've done. Let's check that it works. It's, it's mainly just discussions on the mailing list going, I think this is what we should do. So I, I, I think I'll, I'll try and reach out to people behind the scenes and try and get some you know, on the record statements, but that might take a while. In the meantime, I, I think the document's mostly okay. 
Um, my inclination is that given that PEEP and TTLS are more widely used than TEEP and easier to update, um, if there's any concern about TEEP that causes delays of this document, I would prefer just to drop FAST and TEEP and just have a reference of, you know, this is what we think might work, but we're not really sure. And then rev it later so that we can, we can rev, um, TLS and TEEP, sorry, and TTLS and PEEP all at the same time, which, which are extremely widely used. I don't see any discussion on that. Okay, so I think uh, we'll bring this to list. We probably should have a discussion if uh, if it would help to get uh, either have a, a virtual interim where we get implementers uh, together in the same room or the same virtual room, if that would help um, to kind of work through some yeah. of the issues. I think that would, thanks. Thomas? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll give an overview um, of uh, EEP uh, Noob. And uh, next slide, please. So I'll start with a quick overview of the protocol, then the draft status, and then at the end, I have a couple of technical. Um, issues that may be of interest. One is how we use the NI and then about roaming. Okay, uh, so what problem does EAP Noob uh, aim to solve? Um, well, as we know, there's currently no out of band authentication method uh, for EAP, and the need for this method has now been identified in the new charter uh, for the working group, and uh, EAP Noob is one solution uh, for that problem. Uh, next slide. And um, um, as a quick overview of the protocol, uh, it's an EAP method for user-assisted out-of-band authentication. For example, uh, the user could scan a dynamic QR code or NDEF tag or uh, read a blinking light um, with a mobile phone uh, to uh, deliver the out-of-band message between the peer and the server. And uh, this is a bootstrapping method so that uh, when the out-of-band authentication takes place, the device is also registered at the AAA and uh, then uh, it can, that registration will later be used for a fast re-authentication. Of the, pre, of the registered devices so that no more user interaction or out-of-band communication is needed. Next slide. Here is the architecture picture. Uh, also, as a reminder, um, the main trick here is to do in-band communication over EAP between the new device and uh, then uh, the AAA server and uh, do most of the communication in band over EAP, uh, a cryptographic handshake, and then uh, have one user assisted out of band message uh, to authenticate that in band key exchange. And uh, this idea has now been copied by some other specifications. And uh, maybe I should just to advertise and remind that this originates. The idea is, originates from Mohit's PhD thesis. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, the state of the draft is such that we have worked uh, a few years on it and on the implementations and modeling verification. And the current draft number is seven. Uh, next slide. Uh, there have been no major updates to this version. The main thing is to update the sample messages 
so that they are up to date with the specification uh, text and also have been tested with the implementation. Next slide. Uh, so here is a summary of the draft status. Uh, I think it's pretty mature now. Uh, we have two implementations. There is the implementation for WPA supplicant and host APD done at Alta University and uh, then uh, uh, Contiki implementation mainly at University of Murcia in Spain. And uh, then we have modeled the protocol uh, with formal modeling and verification tools. Uh, on one hand, the protocol state machines and denial of service resistance properties, and uh, then uh, the security protocol and authentication. And uh, I think uh, once the uh, new charter or updated charter is confirmed, this would be ready for a working group adoption and uh, maybe uh, if we can agree on that, then uh, that can be confirmed on the mailing list after the rechartering is complete. So this was uh, uh, the update on the protocol, uh, on the specification. Then I still have a few slides about uh, a kind of uh, more, te more technical stuff. So next slide, please. And uh, you can st still go one more. And uh, first about how we use the NAI. So because the device initially here is not registered with the AAA, uh, it doesn't have a NAI. And uh, for that reason, we use this generic NAI and especially the generic realm, uh, which is currently eapnoob.net, but I understand that it's better to use reserver.arpa domain for this purpose. And uh, why we need this generic realm that is used for routing the EAP noob um, or EAP uh, requests from the new unregistered peers uh, to the correct AAA server. And normally we would expect uh, the network administrators to select a server for that network uh, that handles this uh, out-of-band authentication and interaction with the user and route the radius for the, this uh, generic realm uh, to that specialized server. And uh, then immediately in the initial exchange in EAP Noob, the server assigns a peer ID and a realm uh, to the uh, peer and after that uh, those will be used for routing the requests. Uh, if there is no roaming, then the, they can continue to use the generic realm. But uh, usually, I guess it would be good to assign realm for roaming purposes. So this is how we have solved this uh, naive problem with the uh, unregistered devices in the beginning. And uh, then uh, next slide. Actually, you can go one more if I use the pictures other than the text. So I want to explain a roaming uh, question or problem, uh, how we handle roaming and uh, then uh, what still hasn't been done about it. Okay, so here is the first simpler roaming scenario. Uh, we register a device at home and uh, I use here any roam between a couple of universities as the example. Uh, Next slide. And uh, when EAP Noob is used for authenticating and registering the device, it initially uses this generic realm and ID, and uh, then uh, the local AAA or a specialized uh, radio server for the EAP Noob will handle this EAP Noob authentication. And next slide. As part of that process, uh, in the initial exchange, uh, the AAA uh, assigns a peer ID and realm to the device. Next slide. And later, the same device, if it moves to different parts of the network, it can use that uh, assigned NAI 
for roaming, just as normal. There is nothing specific, special about this, and this works well with the current EAP Noob specification. So that's the kind of roaming that we currently support. Then in the following two slides, I want to talk show kind of what could be done. Uh, so now uh, here is a user who is already at the other parts of the network and not in the home network. And in this foreign network, it's wondering when it has just purchased the fresh device, is wondering whether it can register that. Uh, next slide. The problem uh, they have is that we would need to route the radius requests from this foreign AAA to the home AAA. And uh, then if that was possible, then we could do the authentication with the EAP noob. But because the device now has the generic ID and realm, it cannot really connect uh, your home or the, low, the foreign AAA doesn't know where to route these requests, where does the user want them. And uh, we don't currently have a technical solution. Then next slide. This is the final slide. Uh, so the, uh, we think that there could be some mechanism for the user to interact with the foreign AAA, let's say a web page where it can request routing of the uh, radio requests for the new device uh, to the home AAA. And uh, that would enable registration of new devices while roaming. And this only needs to be done once. And what, then when the EAP Noob Association has been created, the reauthentication will again work as normal roaming without any such special interaction. But uh, this is just something that we have been thinking about, uh, but uh, it's not specified how to do this in the EAP Noob specification. We just have been careful not to prevent this kind of scenarios in the future. That's all I had. If there are any questions or comments. This is uh, Edward Ingles from the University of Murcia. Uh, just to say that I implemented the, the IBNUC version for Contiki, and I will send the email with the GitHub project uh, on the mailing list. Uh, well, I implemented that with uh, Alto University. Great, thank you. Uh, Abhijan Bhattacharya from uh, TCS Research India. So I have a few comments uh, from a different logistics perspective. Uh, the thing is that in Bangkok, I mentioned that uh, considering the startup community growing in uh, the subcontinent level, what we have seen is that there's a gap in terms of uh, securing this, I mean, the knowledge in terms of uh, securing their devices properly. So they have good sensor knowledge. They have good knowledge on the basic hardware. But this kind of solution uh, as a plugin can actually help them for a better service. Uh, but the problem uh, in terms of adopting this solution that I see is that when these companies, uh, they go to market, their end customer would not like to uh, use anything which is non-standard. So, and also implementation wise, uh, getting the, uh, the numbers from INA is very important uh, because people don't really like to change the nitty gritties inside. So uh, probably if it is uh, technically, I mean, it is at some stage and there are implementations already available open source, probably uh, uh, pushing it for adoption and standardization might might find a new opportunity. That's all I wanted to say. This is Elliot. I agree that it, it looks pretty stable. We're not uh, ready to implement yet at Cisco, but um, if others are. Uh, what I wanted to add, though, is I like your uh, discussion about use the NAI, we're basically following, tracking that from a T perspective for onboarding.
Yeah, I think right now we're waiting for the or the charter is currently in IESG review, so we'll see what comes out of that. And hopefully once that goes through, then we'll be set to ad adopt uh, new work items. Uh, Roman Danilo as the AD, just to kind of be precise, the charter, we were through the internal review of the ISG. It's going for external comment, and then it'll come back to the it's ISG. Done with I'm sorry? It's, done with it's, so it's back. All right, perfect. So, so the practical process in case what we did is the charter result first comes to the ISG for kind of a quick look. Are you okay with that? Yes, we're okay with that. Then let's go to the community. Is the community okay with that? And based on the community comments, it then comes back to the ISG. Okay, you heard from the community. Are you now really okay with it? And then it gets approved. Yeah, it did go we for external review that finished uh, on, on the 11th of November. Now it's with the ISG on their meeting on 5th of December. Yeah, like the, the external review period happens just like a ITF last call, basically, and then the IESG gets another ballot so, try at so it. Final yeah. Okay. Just, uh, to, to repeat, Elliot, into the mic, it's on the uh, telechat for the final ballot. Yes, well, <clears throat> good morning. I have been working with ADs who were at some point in that lengthy process able to say uh, you can start operating as if the new charter was in place. So maybe you, you can reach that at some point. I don't know if you're there, but if you're there, maybe you can just say that and uh, the group can proceed. I, I mean, I think we're we're pretty close, but, you know, assuming that uh, once once it goes through, then uh, it, well, I mean, I think we can wait for the telechat. I don't think we kind of have holidays in between then, but. Yeah, sorry, sir. Just checking dates. It's on the telechat for yeah. December 5th. So. We don't I mean, have, yeah. it's in two weeks, so yeah. the, the end is near for, you know, figuring out the closure. All right, let's uh, move to the next presentation, which I think is Brutsky. Can somebody uh, do a little ether padding? Taking some notes? If not, we'll fill them in. Okay, this will be a pretty short presentation, I hope. Next slide, please. All right. Um, wow, these. Uh, it's gonna... So um, we've there. There've only been subtle, cha uh, small changes to EPT Brewski, but larger changes are coming. Um, the first is that uh, the, the all the diagrams have been simplified. There was a lot of hopping over things, and uh, where where it didn't where, uh, in the uh, uh, swimming lane diagrams from uh, UML that didn't need to happen, and so we I I, I cleaned a bunch of that up. Um, so that's done. Um, We've done a bunch of rework of the discussion around NAI, which is almost identical in nature to uh, what you just heard from Noob. Um, and uh, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I, I want to compare text there because I don't see any reason to be inconsistent with what Noob is doing. Um, it, it, seem, it seems about uh, right. Um, the last uh, round of discussions, we what we've realized is that, um, at, at least thanks to Yoni, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of errata open on TEEP, and so there's a lot of work that needs to get done so that TEEP can be more broadly implemented. Um, and so a, cu a couple of things are happening, I think, here. I think we want to broaden out the, this to a TEEP update, um, maybe even de-emphasize the Brewski part in, in this to just make it more of a gener generic uh, TEEP update, but also keep you know the additional um, opcodes, uh, TLBs, uh, for Brewski. Um, and so this ties to a couple of different things. Um, next slide, please. So here are all of the um, errata for uh, Teep. Mohit, so I just had a very short comment on on this uh, uh, doing a update of Teep and, and Brewski. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I apply to my own drafts, I, I don't ask you to do anything what I don't do myself. So I kind of recommend it to myself to split the PSK part out I would kind of recommend the same thing to you to put the Brewski part in a separate draft and fix the T Pirata as, as a separate document. The reason I'm saying this is because now T is finally getting implemented in, in Windows and, and in other places, and uh, we, which is very nice. And we should kind of uh, fix the errata in, in, in one document. And I'm not sure if 
like all use cases would use Brewski and like my Windows laptop probably won't come with LDEV ID, IDEV IDs and so on. So maybe, like, I, I, as I said, I'm a fan of small modular documents. So maybe splitting them up makes sense. Yeah. And uh, I tend to think of it as the opposite, actually, Mohit, because um, from an implementer standpoint, if I have to end up reading 100 documents to implement to implement TEEP or Actually, there, there are, Teep's not the worst offender here, but there are a couple of, of, of protocols in the ITF that are really bad because you end up really have to sift through a, a lot of documents. I don't want to start down that road. If we can get, and many of these are, I think, relatively simple changes, and nothing should require that people have to implement a Brewski opcode in the process, and that's part of the rewrite would be that you just don't, you don't make them mandatory, but if you do, here's what you do. Yeah, I should have added no strong opinion, so I leave it okay. to the best of your judgment. Yeah, and there are a couple of things here that are well outside, say, the voucher aspects of Ruski that um, probably are, are worth capturing in TEEP that we that just got missed the first time around. So, for instance, um, the get CSR attributes uh, function that that's in um, that's in Ruski probably is something that is needed more in an EST-like function, which is what TEEP tracked, and so you probably want to keep that one way or the other. Um, even if at the end of the day we decided to drop all the Brewski, the, the rest of the, the voucher ones. Um, <clears throat> there are other aspects here too, um, which is if we're going to open up Teep Draft, there may be a couple of other TLVs uh, that we want to add. Um, in any case, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I went through all of um, the, the, uh, the errata, and some of them are really straightforward, right? I mean, you, you have typos. In various places that uh, Twitter caught, for instance, um, and some of them uh, are also um, really very rather simple clarifications. So you see where it says accept, accept, accept. These are just suggestions as to how we might proceed in a draft in, in a draft update. Um, not something we have to decide on today, but you know a rough cut of where I see uh, uh, things going. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of places where um, the, uh, the, the, the there's pretty involved discussion that Yoni provides, um, especially when, when it comes to uh, some of the derivations. Um, and that those, those really do require more discussion when it comes to, to TEEP. Um, some of them are, you know, relatively simple, like um, relatively simple clarifications, like uh, when to uh, make sure you're using um, intermediate results um, when you're actually using, when you're actually processing intermediate results and don't try and return um, the, the crypto binding instead, because um, the intermediate result, I think, includes essentially the, the same crypto binding functionality. Um, there's like Yoni's text there is, I thought, pretty close to accurate. There was like corner cases there like, um, oh, what if you're actually finished, then you actually do want to do the crypto binding. And, and he, he, you know, that's it's just small word wordsmithing along those lines. Um, <clears throat> So um, I think these these are the list. It's not a huge list, um, and it's just something I think we can knock through over the next couple of, I won't say next couple of months, but probably it's going to take a couple of cycles and meetings actually to, to, to make sure we're comfortable with this. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so these are sort of the, the, the new TLVs that are in there already, and then um, I think we just go through and sift and decide which ones are, are useful to keep, which ones are which ones we might want to add. And I think this also ties quite closely to the onboarding discussions that we're having as to how we bind to various onboarding mechanisms before you even get to EAP. So for this purpose, what I'm suggesting is that we slow roll some of this. And if it really slow rolls, then I would have to agree with you, Mohit, that we would want to, to separate out the clarifications. Um, but if we're not going to, if it's not going to be too slow, then let's just proceed and, and see how far we get. So I think there's one more slide. Right. So, um, yeah, there's this interaction aspect. So how does TEEP interact with other 802.11 capabilities and, and DPP in particular? Um, how do you do network selection from wireless and how do you bind from a DPP application, from a DPP um, transaction into TEEP if you're going to do that? And some of that has to be worked out architecturally, and this ties to the discussion that we've been having about, you know, how do you how these building blocks look together, and, and what does that mean from a from a how do we discuss that at the IETF? Um, 
So I don't want to blow up the, you know, this into a huge issue. It's, it's really not, uh, I don't think, but um, we, we are tying, uh, this is a little bit bigger than just TEEP. Next slide. <coughs> okay, so, um, you know, one of the things we can do is just have a section that goes through and accepts, you know, or, or provides an update on, on how we deal with the errata. Then we have another issue, which is how do we deal with TLS 1.3? Um, I sort of like the idea of um, uh, having that done in the other document that Alan's doing. Um, one of the reasons is that um, I don't think, maybe Dan is, but the rest of us aren't really TLS 1.3 experts. And if we could knock that through in the other document, I think it'd probably be easier. Um, but I'm, I'm not religious about that either. Um, so, uh, you know, the proposal here is less focus on Brewski, more focus on update. As I said, roll it slow, get some more code going. We actually have some code uh, that we've done in both WPA supplicant and in, um, uh, and in the host APD code. Um, that code's not yet ready for release because it's slightly embarrassing in terms of one or two points, and I would rather not be quite that embarrassed. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you know, probably in March, the document will look a little bit cleaner in terms of how this looks, and that will be that will give you a good view as to whether or not to adopt. Is the way I see it, and that would be the you know, where, where I would leave things for now. Yeah. Well, one of the things I kind of hope is we could uh, knock through the errata. That we don't we can resolve the errata without having them in the document, and then just right the the document would just reflect the changes. Right. So that would be fine. I think I, we I can mind. do that, you know, kind of in process as we work through them. Cause some of them, yeah, might take a little bit longer, but many of them, like you say, are pretty straightforward. And if we can start knocking those off, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, so here's yeah. what I propose then, Joe. Um, I will take as an action to, to post, to, to post these each as an issue, right? Each of the errata as an issue with a proposal, how to address I suggest the chairs track them as separate issues, right? And then you guys have the option of closing or, or not, and, and, you know, based on the working group's view. And then when, once the, as, as we're doing that in, in parallel, we can also deal with the other deep work that's being done. Okay. That sounds like a plan. Okay. I'm done. Cool. <sighs> Who's next? Let me just pick some. Yeah. Max. Hello, everybody. I'm Max Pala. Uh, I'm here to talk about eCreds. Uh, we already presented last time on this. I uh, want to provide some updates, uh, some consideration about the work that we're doing with its applicability and what are the next steps that we envision. Next slide, please. Okay, so, um, problem statement. I work for Cable Labs, so we have our members, our operators that um, tend to deploy different type of networks, uh, from Wi-Fi with public access point to cellular networks, CBRS, which is um, <clears throat> practically 4G and 5G doing uh, in unlicensed spectrum, uh, like multifire, um, or our networks, like DOCSIS networks, right? Um, however, there's one, um, one problem that our members always report. It's very difficult to manage, to dynamically manage these credentials for their access networks. And they really would like to have the possibility uh, to change these credentials depending on the risk level that they, that is, that they want to accept in their networks, right? Um, so today it's very difficult for them to have a centralized system that does this uh, across different networks, different technologies. Um, next slide. Uh, and of course, we don't use uh, one type of credentials. We use different type of credentials like username, password, secret keys, and certificates. So certificate is one of them. Um, <clears throat> and you know, usually having multiple methods uh, uh, can improve device diversity in your in your network sometimes and the possibility to switch between uh, between type of credentials um, and security manages these credentials is not easy right uh, so uh, we've seen some proposals to manage the credentials through through EAP, um, but um, there's no um, consistency about being able to manage 
all type of credentials. Uh, we focus mostly on certificates because this is a very common use case, uh, but we have other use cases that involve, you know, uh, keys or username and passwords, and especially in IoTs, this a mix type of um, type of credentials that have been deployed. Next slide. Uh, so what are we trying to focus with our work? So our work is trying to provide an encapsulation mechanism, right? So that you can uh, use your own provisioning mechanism uh, and or encapsulate standard mechanism that already exists. Uh, why do we think this is a, a good approach, right? Uh, we work in many different environments like uh, WFA, for example, where uh, they use a different approach. They propose um, that devices get their own IP address, get in a jail state, basically can reach a OZU server, which is a, a online sign up server. And then uh, <clears throat> from there, then they can uh, get their credentials and then authenticate to the network. Uh, however, you know, some operators reported that they don't feel comfortable deploying this type of solutions because now you have devices that are not authenticated uh, and they can probe your network uh, because they have IP, so they can have uh, routability. Um, we think that this solution solves this problem because now you cannot route your message uh, and it's, it, from a security standpoint of view, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and as <laughs> Moit before uh, suggested also for Bruski, we think that uh, with our protocol being generic, you can have profiles for that for your use case. Um, uh, so, for example, if you want to implement a full set of uh, standard, you know, like EST, you can implement the full EST, or you can just implement the renewal because that's the use case that that uh, makes sense for you. Next slide. Uh, so, just very briefly and very quickly, uh, what, how we organize the EPCRADs, uh, we try to uh, provide three different uh, phases for now: the initialization, the management, and the validation. The initialization is the part that. Uh, you can use to bootstrap uh, the process. Uh, you can use tokens or voucher that can be uh, bare tokens or can be tied to a key. So there's all methods that you can use for, for authentication. But basically, this the initialization says, the device says, oh, these are the credentials that I have for your network. Do you want to do something with it? Uh, and then basically, the, uh, the server can start if it, needs, if it wants to start the management phase where you can renew or deploy a new type of credentials if it's supported by the device. And then optionally verify that actually what the device has corresponds to what the server thinks uh, it should have. Next slide. So what has changed so far? Well, um, we simplified the proposal because we received <laughs> feedback from the, uh, from the work group. These are documents that are very long. We want them to simplify so that they can be understood better. Um, so we we decided well uh, from from the main list they said it's okay if you say that you you have to rely on a secure method uh, before executing this so this um this actually helps us because we say well you have to have a secure channel but we're not going to go into the description how to get that once you have that like for example for eptls eptp e uh, or other uh, mechanism uh, then you can use this method and the, we, we, we simplified certain things uh, by removing that. But at the same time, we added new text because one of the items that was left over was uh, to define one basic protocol that could handle all different type of credentials. Um, and we call now SPP or simple provisioning protocol, but it's just a very simple thing. Um, and basically this tried to provide one method so it's not the only method. Uh, so the, the EPCREDS is meant to be an encapsulation method. Um, and next slide. Uh, because of this, right, we, we thought about simplifying the, the, uh, the document by removing the, the SPP. We just put it there, maybe put it in a separate document so that EPCREDS is a shorter encapsulating method and the SPP can be implemented there or not. Um, now, um, there are some other things that we might uh, and we might simplify the document to make it even shorter. Uh, but I hope that we can do it in the next um, in the next version of the draft. Next slide. Of course, I want to thank everybody that really helped us um, in making the proposal better, uh, and also <laughs> the chairs uh, because um, uh, the the charter text has been. Uh, a long time discussion, and finally we get we get there. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, next slide. 
uh, almost. Uh, so um, what are uh, what are requests here? So uh, of course we're focusing on the use case that makes sense for our members because this is something that we want to deploy in our networks. Uh, we also working with uh, CBRS where I think it, uh, on the 14th was um, the for release three. Ipcreds was adopt, adopted to manage the credentials for uh, cellular networks, uh, for CBRS networks. Um, then we're working also with the Wireless uh, Broadband Alliance. Uh, they were interested in to see, can we use this to provision credentials uh, in their environment and um, Wi-Fi? Um, we're going to present there uh, soon. Uh, there's no date yet. So this is some work that can, that can go also in the WBA. Next slide. Uh, we don't think that the document is ready for thinking about adopting the work group. Um, we want to simplify that and uh, make some tweaks before, uh, before we think it's ready for evaluation. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, we can do it soon and maybe by the ne next time uh, we can think about adopting it. Uh, this is the reference for the current ID that we have. I know it's very <laughs> it's late and <laughs> most of you have the eyes like, very open, but if you have any question, please. Uh, hello, I'm from Xia Huawei. Um, you know, um, in a lot of IoT or device onboarding uh, uh, procedure, uh, usually we have some pro provisioning uh, or cre credential on the device. And we use it for the authentication and for the later network access control. So, but uh, here you propose that uh, we uh, we do the credential provision, you know, when the device is uh, is uh, joining the network. So I don't know the relation between the, you know, the current method and uh, what is the typical use case for your method. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, with the with this method, actually, you can still continue to use that that approach in the sense that. Um, when you do an initialization phase, if the device doesn't have uh, as some credentials that you may leverage to register the device, that happens in the two initial message. So there's two messages in the initialization phase. Mm. Uh, and you can use that, that method to um, leverage credentials that already exist. Uh, mm. But on top of that, uh, you, can, you can decide, well, I like these credentials. These are the credentials, for example, that were put there for certification. You have an OCF device. You have, you know, some devices that have certification already certificate. But that particular method of authentication for your network, you don't think is appropriate. Or mm -hmm. let's put it this way: you want to change. So you can yeah. you can use that credentials to register the device and then deploy the credentials that uh, you would like yeah. the okay. device to use the next time they they okay. access the network. Okay. Something like that. So think about uh, you might have a voucher, you might have uh, something that is tied to, to a key or not, or just presenting one time token, right, to register the device that you obtain from a, a website somewhere. Uh, we don't specify that. This is outside the scope of the, the of the protocol. But the, our use case, for example, for our Doxys network or CBRS is you have some SIM credentials, you can leverage them. Uh, to deploy this, uh, you know, other type of credential like certificates or username and password in that, in that environment. The same things uh, we are thinking for our uh, next generation of cable networks that we are working on delivering the 10G, uh, 10 gigabit platform. Uh, we think that because the other number of entities that are going to be on our networks, we need to have some form of authentication and credentials managing uh, that we use through it, uh, not only for the clients, the cable modems and uh, DVRs, etc., but also for the infrastructure. So this would allow us to have a very centralized system for all our operators, which is very interesting for them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. I think in general, I like this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Max. So I think what you're there's a lot here that you're doing that I think is really interesting because it, it tracks precisely to this morning's conversation, right? In terms of how we onboard with IoT, um, I have one I have one major concern. <clears throat> well, it's one major concern, but it's it's a lengthy one, and I'll apologize in advance for that. <laughs> which is, um, first of all, it, it it seems like you have sort of the 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 kitchen sink approach here, right? In terms of there are all these different mechanisms that you're going to try and reference with an EAP cred. Um, what we are suffering with in IoT right now is fragmentation. 
of, of, of all this. And I realize you're trying to defragment by, by finding at least one consolidation point, but I'm concerned that with so many mechanisms, it actually won't consolidate. Um, and so one of the things that we talked about this morning was, can we distill down architecturally what is really needed to bind between these, you know, the input process for, for EAP, if you will, versus the output process from what came before? And I wonder if we want to just take a step back a little bit as we go through that and, and say, okay, can we, can we distill this down to something like we discussed this morning as, as a, you know, something like an EDCSA public private key pair or something along those lines? Maybe the public EDSA is, EDCSA is probably a little too specific, right? You probably need a code point approach in this. And I'm not even sure about how to manage the code points in that regard. But if we can distill that down, then there's another opportunity here. And the other opportunity is that our two drafts merge, right? And, and that we, we, we sort of proceed forward along those lines. Um, I haven't actually thought all of that through, but I think that's a discussion we should have. Um, and I really like the idea of merging in one particular regard, which is less fragmentation. But as part of that, I think we, we need to understand each of the use cases that you were attempting to address with all those different enrollment mechanisms. And, you know, I think the, uh, the, the gentleman from Siemens, Siemens are here and in, in your draft in Anima, right? You have, um, you, you had to try and chisel down, right? What, what sort of enrollment, enrollment approaches you really wanted to tackle, right? Do you want to throw SCEP in, in, in yours, for instance? And, you know, uh, and I think there are some use cases that they have. Right, uh, that that need to be reviewed in this context. So, as all as part of this, if we can distill this down, then we can reduce the fragmentation, and that will accelerate deployment. Mm, yeah, Elliot, thank you uh, for the question. Um, yeah, definitely, if we can uh, and maybe merge the two proposals, if if we, you know, they both fit the use cases, great, less work and better work. Um, um, so far, uh, architecturally wise, the, what we are working on is try not to put architecture in this, uh, but uh, let you decide the architecture. So uh, this comes from, you know, the, the, um, uh, our operators, they usually have some purchasing power <laughs> uh, for devices. So th that, that usually helps them to have more freedom when they have to decide how to manage the credentials. But um, <laughs> Coming to the point that you were saying about the, uh, you know, defining all this fragmentation for these uh, provisioning protocols, I totally agree with you. We have that problem, um, and this is not a new problem. You know, whenever you need to uh, implement a provisioning uh, uh, protocol, you have to choose which one, which option of that provisioning protocol, etc. Uh, that's definitely true. My plan is not to. Um, to do this work for every uh, protocols that we have. Um, as I said before, we have a proposal for the SPP, which is very simple, meant to be the minimal version, not super flexible, um, like other uh, provisioning protocol, uh, but sufficient, let's put it away, sufficient for, for a good implementation. And if you want to go over and have, you know, uh, using um, something like Bruski, et cetera, you could still uh, integrate that, right? Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to point out, um, uh, this could be used, for example, so, and we talked about this this morning, um, when you have DPP, for example, the approach that they're using for the personal use in the, uh, uh, in the WFA, um, to be transported over the uh, enterprise, so over, um, uh, over EAP, uh, by encapsulating the DPP uh, packets on the EAP. So you could potentially use DPP also in, uh, through EAP. Um, it's just an example of how this would enable new tools um, that might might find you in use cases. But um, so this is all. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next uh, presentation, which I think is uh, yeah. You should be on. Okay, I, I hope you feel, hear me fine. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Jan Frederik Rikas. I'm uh, currently a student in Bremen in Germany. Um, and I have submitted this draft, um, yeah, just as an idea. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I'm working on 
at our networking center in Bremen, and I am dealing with Edurome. And one experience I had when dealing with Edurome is that the certificate checks on supplicants in EAP TLS are known to be faulty. And with faulty, I mean not badly implemented, but uh, they don't really happen in a way that uh, we should, uh, that they should happen. Um, so they use very insecure defaults. For example, in Android devices, there was not a really default for checking with Android versions, at least prior to version seven. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, so the certificate checking was disabled by default. Current Androids have this uh, option, use system certificates with a domain input and not really a documentation what this domain should be. Uh, Windows, Mac OS, iOS, they question the user for the certificate. And at least for Windows, um, you just see a fingerprint and no information about the common name or the issuer. Um, so that is a big issue in Edurome, in Bremen at least. Um, so the reason for that is, from my perspective, that uh, the EAP TLS specification lacks a specific method or specific data to determine if the certificate is valid for this specific use. Um, and uh, I think this should be solved by giving the supplicants uh, some means to determine if the certificate is valid um, for the intended use by in, uh, including information into the certificate that is implicitly defined by the communication context. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, um, my proposed solution for that um, is to add a new certificate extension that explicitly defines a valid realm for this um, uh, certificate um, for which EAP realm uh, this certificate should be used. Um, this is a big advantage um, because the username is implicitly known uh, from the communication context and the realm can be extracted from that. And uh, CAs can validate this if the realm is a DNS name. And uh, especially in Edurome, um, this is true um, for the realms. Um, I have ish, um, asked for comments on the mailing list and I have some other ideas uh, seen on the mailing list. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, there is uh, RFC 7585, the NAI, NAI realm uh, specified there, which is intended to help with roaming federation contest, uh, connections. Um, so this is one uh, idea that was uh, very um, like the first response um, that I'm redoing this work here. Um, from my perspective, um, this could be a solution to also use that for EAP TLS, but I don't think this is a good idea to just simply reuse that because it is uh, not the same scope. Another idea would be to um, specify a specific prefix for the um, subject alt name, uh, DNS name, or even for common name in the certificate. Um, for example, eaptls.uni-bremen.de for the uni-bremen.de realm. Um, but my suggested solution would be to use this uh, new certificate extension. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so the feedback I received for that um, is to possibly just reuse the OID from the RFC 7585 uh, NII realm. Um, maybe, and that is also an idea that uh, came to my mind after submitting this draft, is to also add a specific extended key usage for EAP TLS server authentication. Because currently, speaking for Bremen, Edurome as well, um, the certificate we use has the extended key usage for TLS web server and client authentication. and from my perspective, this um, leads to quite a lot of problems because it is quite easy if uh, people just type in their username and their password um, to set up a rogue access point and get credentials there. So um, 
yeah, this is my first draft uh, for the ITF. Um, so I would be very happy to, to receive feedback if this goes in the right direction, um, if there's something I have missed, um, if this is useful. Hey, this is Elliot again. Um, you know, Frederick, thanks for the draft. Uh, I think this ties a little bit to the work that Owen's doing, if I understand correctly, um, in uh, in terms of realm identification. I think, Owen, you're going to talk to that. Is that right later? Or maybe not in this room, but I think it, we, 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 have, we have looked at, at similar issues in terms of <laughs> similar aspects that I think relate a little bit to your ACME work. Um, and 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 so I think there there are a couple of things that are hiding out there. What I was going to say is I was a little unclear of the use case though, in terms of uh, when when you need that realm in the edge room, in, in, available in edge room, for instance. In term, is it that you the, the certificate is being presented inappropriately elsewhere, or that you're not being able to select the certificate um, uh, for for edge room's use in a context of the federation? Um, so the, 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 the main problem with the certificate checking is that it is uh, quite common or it was quite common for a lot of a uh, long time that users just typed in their username and password um, and did not select any certificate uh, attributes uh, and especially with the user interface in Eduro, uh, in Android, uh, this was the easiest way and um, my aim is to help to get a secure default that uh, supplicants know exactly from the certificate that this is uh, valid for the intended use. So this is Owen, just to clarify what Ali was talking about. What I'm going to talk about in five minutes time is the other side of the house, which is how Wacom can be used to issue client-side certs. But this is more relevant for as Brisky Cloud, where it's going to come up at, Ac at Anima later on in the week, which is um, when a cloud registrar redirects an entity to a AAA how does the entity verify the triple A's identity? Um, <clears throat> Bernard about Microsoft. So I, I have a question about how you intend this to be used. Is the idea that you don't feel that the user should be prompted to okay the certificate and that should have somehow automatically check the NAI against this NAI realm and just allow it? Is that the idea? Uh, definitely, yes. Yeah. I, I guess I don't understand. It seems like a very dangerous thing because what prevents you have a cert to claim any NII realm, right? They did, like I, my corporation, I'll, I'll claim I have owned the NII realm for whatever. I don't actually own it. It has no relationship to the cert. And now you're not putting up a dialog box so I can basically uh, infect the user system with a, with a false NII realm claim. Right? I can, I can put whatever I want in there. Like I'm Joe Blow's fish shop and I'll claim, you know, that I own the NII realm for, you know, NSA, US Gov, right? And and you'll accept that automatically. Is that the idea? Um, well, basically, the the idea is um, because in Eduroam we deal with uh, public CAs, public trusted CAs, uh, a lot um, to help um, the, uh, to have this certificate attribute also verified by uh, trusted CAs. So that, of course, um, if if I have uh, control over uni-bremen.de, then I should be the only one who is uh, allowed to uh, be issued a certificate with the uni-bremen.de realm. Yeah, okay. I guess I don't we're, understand how you... We're going to cut that. the line. Or hold the Yeah. Yeah, Carsten Bormann, uh, just a quick uh, observation here. Um, improving the security uh, can be done in, in several ways here. And uh, given that we are talking about an environment in which uh, most endpoints are broken, um, it, it's really hard to reason about security. And um, one uh, observation is that it really helps uh, to be able to build your production system out in such a way that it rejects a larger part of the broken end systems, or of the systems that are not only broken but also misconfigured. So that, that, that's maybe a slightly different objective that we have in mind here um, than you are usually working with. 
Alan? Yeah. Um, so to address Bernard's point, um, that, that, that's certainly true. But I think one of the issues now is the supplicants by default don't trust any of the root CAs for um, TLS authentication. They do trust it for HTTPS. And one of the issues is that all of the TLS server certificates have this TLS web server OID. Um, and I think it would help if the CAs would issue certificates specifically for ETLS, um, at which point the supplicants could default trust all the root CAs and then validate that that certificate coming over ETLS is actually an ETLS certificate. So I, I think what young Frederick has, has pointed out here is, is an issue not just with this particular OID, but I think there may be a need for a larger eat practices document as to what the supplicant should do, what the CA should do. Um, and I think it would certainly help with adoption rather a lot because it'd be very, very nice to be able to say, you know, here's my identification. I'm in realm X and I connect to some random SSID. Hey, I get a certificate which says it's for that realm. It's signed by a root CA I trust. Therefore, I don't have to do the whole clickety clickety click thing that everyone has to do now. So I, I, th I think this is an issue which is worth working on. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you, uh, Jan Frederick, and I'm sure we'll have uh, more discussion on this on the list. So. Everyone wants to go to the bar, so I'll be really quick. Um, so it's a problem that Avaya and Cisco are trying to solve. Um, go on to the next slide. Um, uh, so what this describes is it's a mechanism by which we can use Acme for integrating with multiple different protocols that are used for issuing device and client-side certs. Um, next. Uh, so the doc describes multiple different use cases, how Acme can be integrated with EST, with Brewski, with the new Brewski Cloud Registrar, but for, what's of most importance to this room is how it can be integrated with Teep and with um, Teep Brewski, or which has been rebranded as Teep Update with extension for bootstrapping. Um, and I think that Acme actually requires the extensions, the new TLVs that have been defined in the Teep Update. Um, so I don't think that Acme will cleanly integrate with Teep. There's a couple of problems with Teep as it currently stands. Next slide. Um, so what's changed since we last presented this? So what Acme integrations used to cover was Acme for subdomains as well. That has been broken out based on feedback at uh, the Acme working group last last year, or sorry, last session. And that's been presented to Acme this, this time around. What Acme for subdomains does, it's a very nice integration for, for client-side um, cert issuance. It allows an Acme client to prove domain ownership of a parent domain, and then the client can then send in certificate requests for hundreds or thousands of subdomain certs off that parent domain without having to prove domain ownership explicitly for each client site cert. Um, the Brisky Cloud Register use case has been added, and there's been a couple of updates to um, uh, Elliot's draft. And the two most important ones that we've added is um, a CSR attributes one, and one that you missed in your presentation, Elliot, is a, a retry after TLV. And the retry after TLV will be really, really useful when um, the Teep server wants to issue a cert to the client but is not willing to do it yet. It can't do it yet. Yeah, so next slide. Um, so at its core, like the, this draft, it, it should only be informational. It doesn't require any changes to Acme. It will not require any changes to EST or Teep or Teep update. Um, what EST and TEEP do is EST and TEEP define um, protocols by which the client can interact with the server, but it doesn't specify how the server interacts with the backend CA. And Acme can be used to integrate with the backend CA. Next slide. Um, so just an overview of the flow. So this is this is boilerplate Acme. This is how you can use Acme to um, do domain claim using DNS. Next slide. This is just boil skip over this. That's just standard TEEP tunnel establishment. Uh, this is where it gets interesting. Um, so this is standard TEEP, but doesn't um, have the new TLVs that have been defined in TEEP update. Um, the client sends in a PKCS10 request to the TEEP server. The TEEP server then turns around and sends an Acme new order request. 
followed by an ACME finalized request, followed by the ACME certificate request. Again, everything on the left-hand side is standard TEEP. Everything on the right-hand side is standard ACME, no changes to the protocol. And it ends up with um, the client been issued a certificate that is sent by the TEEP server using the PKCS10, P, sorry, a PKCS7 TLV um, to the pledge. Next slide. So what the next slide covers, it's, it's the new TLVs that have been defined in the TEEP update. It defines what happens and how, how a client leverages these new TLVs. So first is the client doesn't know what attributes to include in the CSR request. So the client sends a new TEEP CSR attributes request to the TEEP server, gets a response. So for example, that in, could include specific information on what subject to include or what SAN to include. Um, the client then in step three sends a PKCS10 TLV to the TEEP server. TEEP server turns around and interacts with ACME. ACME will turn around and say, the status is processing. I'm not ready to issue a cert yet. I'll issue a cert in a certain period of time. ACME has a mechanism for specifying a retry after interval to the ACME client. The TEEP server is the ACME client and turns around and uses the new retry after TLV to send that retry back to the client. The client will then retry after that timeout has occurred. And the way that the TEEP update draft is currently specified, is there's two different mechanisms for doing the retry. One is within the tunnel, if it's a short interval, Two is outside the tunnel if it's a long interval, and that's indicated via either a 1xx or a 2xx error code in TLV, in TEEP TLV. Um, and then finally, after the retry, the client, what's illustrated here is it's happening inside the same tunnel. The client in step nine sends the exact same PKCS10 request again to the TEEP server. TEEP server then goes to ACME, and the finalized order is ready. It downloads the cert and re returns it to the client in the PKCS7. <laughs> Next slide, the final slide. So the discussion of what's, what's missing from the draft is security considerations, and the security considerations need to touch on all the integrations, so e EST and Brewski and ACME and TEEP. Um, but the biggest, the biggest thing that I'd like to discuss here and the questions I'd like to get feedback from is because this spans multiple working groups, ACME, Anima, EMU, what do we do with this? Where do we go next with this with this draft? Several people and several organizations have expressed interest in it, but we don't know where it lands. <laughs> That's it. People are saying sex is bad. Whispering is bad. Yeah. Why aren't any uh any Questions, comments, or? Uh, not really okay. on this point, some other point. Uh, just a clarification question. Uh, when you do the, the translation between the two protocols, how do mm. you handle the uh, account management uh, that is in ACME? Uh, so is the, the account that is used to request the certificates from the AAA server or from the client? Well, the, the TEEP server is the ACME client. Oh, right. the OK, thank you. Yeah. Roman. Uh, Roman Dini. So back to the kind of the question, where do we do it? Unfortunately, I know the SEC dispatch agenda is full, so we can't take it there kind of later this week. So we can start. I'm sorry. Huh? There, there is still that. Yeah. You're right, Ben. Uh, yeah, the question I was going to ask is, I mean, would this working group be against doing the work here? And we can ask the, you know, ACME as well. Hi, Frank. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Is there any relation of this uh, uh, draft with the Brewski? Yes, it can, uh, it's, which, it's, it can integrate with Brewski. What, so, what, what relation? So Brewski is built on top of EST, so the actual certain enrollment mechanism in Brewski just uses boilerplate EST. Yes. Um, and this can integrate with EST, and that when the client sends the EST simple enroll or full enroll message to the EAP server, the EAP server can turn around and turn it into an ACME request. Okay, because what, and, and in fact, okay. if you read the EST draft, the EST draft says that when the server is deployed as a registration authority, as an RA, the protocol and the interactions between the RA and the certificate authority is out of scope of the EST draft. So it could be ACME. Yes, uh, um, because, uh, but, um, but my, my point is that, uh, yeah, I understand your point, but that's just the very last step of the enrollment of the device. So, yes. but Brusky is, uh, is mainly about the, you know, the, 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 from the beginning uh, until the EST. 
So yeah, the, but, the, the, uh, only, the only relationship is is what's behind that EST Simple Enroll API, and what's behind the EST Simple Enroll um, API could be Acme. Yeah, uh, uh, my point is that uh, comparing to other working group, I think the Bruski has little relation, uh, very few relation with your work. Other may be more related. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think you know I, we can do a poll here. I don't know if that's gonna. I think. How many people have read the document? Okay, uh, three people. So I, I think we have to get a little more, uh, you know, people looking at it. And, you know, if there is interest, I don't, I don't think that it's impossible to do it in this working group. It doesn't strike me as necessarily being the most logical group to do it in. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I suppose it's as good as any. So Joe, one of, one of the agenda items for ACME this week is should it be adopted by ACME. Okay. So if they adopt it, then that's great. I'd say the answer would be no from ACME though, right? So they'll say no, take it to EMU or take it to somewhere else. The, the, the only reason I think, this is Elliot, the only reason I think it should be adopted here is that it's, it's gonna normally block on the TEEP update. It's gonna normatively block on the TEEP update. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, if the work's happening here, if you're gonna normally block, normatively block on something in ACME, then, then it's a 710 split. Okay, well, I, I think there's you know more discussion to be had. All right, I think uh, that's it for this edition of your EMU working group meeting. Yeah. All right. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. That worked okay, I guess. Hey, John. So, like, yeah, I, I just, you know, since there are these questions, I just was unresolved, right? And maybe it's fine, the text on the NAI. Okay. It's not like a big deal. No, yeah. Yes. Maybe this text is currently in the privacy section, and maybe we can have a section on this idea. Like, because currently the privacy section says that.